a big welcome to Professor Stroud for joining us, as I said, also at short notice with the strike cancellations, but also uh, it's just wonderful to have uh, you as our first speaker to inaugurate this reading group. And I'd like to thank Priyanka and Kumar for their enormous background work they've done in setting this up, because I think it's a wonderful um, uh, initiative that is very badly needed, I think, here at Cambridge. We really need to have some more conversations like this, and I'm very proud that it's happening here within the Department of Sociology, which is very, um, you know, very much hoping that we can kind of, this could be the start of something uh, ongoing for uh, a longer period of time. Um, so I'm just very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say, and I think my role as chair is really just going to be to moderate the discussion, um, probably have some questions for you as well. So please carry on, start. It's it's over to you. Well, well, thank you, uh, Professor. And this is uh, Kamud and Priyanka. Thank you so much for having me as, I, I believe, the first speaker of this Embedcar reading group at Cambridge. And, you know, my project is kind of one slice of the spectrum of the life and the thought that is Baba Sahib Embedkar. And, you know, I, I come at this as a philosopher by highest training. I, you know, made, I did my dissertation and my first book was on, uh, you know, John Dewey. And so I came to this topic kind of late, but Embedkar has changed my view of what pragmatism means. And in some ways, uh, what I found in Embedkar's philosophy is what I always wanted to squeeze out of John Dewey's philosophy, for instance, in my 2011 book. So today I want to talk to you all about parts of this story of pragmatism, of the evolution of pragmatism in India. And you know, a lot more of this is going to come out in my book. Uh, so I will share my screen. I have some slides that kind of show some of the archival story, and maybe that'll be even more exciting and keep you awake better uh, than my, my uh, you know, ramblings here. Let me uh, share my screen. So you should see uh, the slides. So you know, the title of my talk today is The Evolution of Embedkar's Navayana Pragmatism. And I will explain what I mean by Navayana Pragmatism. That's part of the challenge is does he offer something new into this kind of tradition that flows through James, Dewey, and other parts of the world called pragmatism? So let me uh, talk about some aspects of this project. Now, everyone knows or has heard probably, or every biography at least, mentions this line, right? When Bedkar wrote to his uh, second wife, Savita and Bedkar, on, you know, from New York, but right after he arrived in New York to get his honorary doctorate, and right after he heard the news, that uh, you know, John Dewey had died, his teacher. And he says, oh, I was looking forward to meeting Professor Dewey, but he died on the second. He actually died on the first, but he, he says he died on the second when our plane was in Rome. And I'm so sorry, I owe all my intellectual life to him. He was a wonderful man. You know, and this has always struck people as denoting kind of the importance of the teacher, John Dewey of Embedkar. Uh, but no one has really said anything more about this, right? And it seemed like the story stops there. You know, and, and so as a pragmatist philosopher, I've always been intrigued by this. And as someone who has always known about the Indian tradition and its radical pluralism, I cut my teeth writing on Vedanta, uh, you know, Swami Vivekananda, these kind of figures. Uh, you know, I was intrigued by this. And the more I looked into Embedkar, the more I saw that someone had to tell a deeper, more expansive story of the relationship between John Dewey and Bimrao Embedkar. The question was just who was going to put the effort in to do that? And could it be done with the available evidence? So uh, today I'm going to kind of get around some of these questions that I have been, you know, in, engaging in my articles and also in my forthcoming book. Uh, questions that have to do with the relationship between Dewey uh, and Embedkar and pragmatism. Questions that have to do with what Embedkar added uh, that was new to this kind of very pluralistic tradition of pragmatism. And one of those things you'll see at the end of my talk that he added very uniquely was this idea of Buddhism, Navayana Buddhism, as an essential part to his kind of pragmatist philosophy. Now, this, this uh, you know, research project has led me to India some five or six or seven times. Uh, I've met some of the, my best friends in the world there. I love going back to India because I have a lot of nice people I know that know Embedkar, and we can talk about something that I'm very passionate about. And part of the excitement is trying to find new archival resources, uh, anything that lets us get into the mind of Baba Sahib. So I have tried to find every book that Embedkar has underlined or annotated in his younger years or even his later years. I've tried to find every notebook he left. I've you know, even found notebooks from his wife, Savita. So anything that can kind of get in to the mind behind the writings of Embedkar to kind of give us a more expansive picture 
of what he was about, what caused him to be that way, and what novelty he did with all those parts of his education. Uh, all these things I look for uh, in various places. Now, probably the most comprehensive statement of this, if not the most exciting, but my talk will hopefully be more exciting, but my book that's coming out in March from the University of Chicago Press, The Evolution of Pragmatism in India, uh, is the, I believe, the most comprehensive account, historical and conceptual, of the relationship between Dewey's pragmatism and Dewey the person, and Ambedkar's philosophy and Ambedkar the pragmatist. Uh, it also should be coming out in India from HarperCollins in April in time for Ambedkar Gianti this year. Uh, but let's let's talk a little bit about some of the parameters of the questions that book engages. Well, you know, if you've heard of pragmatism, pragmatism's you know usually called a distinctive American philosophy because it arises in a, a small group of thinkers in America after the Civil War. Although they were re responding to traditions in Europe and traditions in Europe that were brought over to America, like neo Hegelianism, and these thinkers that typically anchor prag the pragmatist tradition are figures like Charles Peirce, William James, John Dewey, and Jane Addams. Now, of course, you can keep expanding that circle out. You can keep expanding that circle to people like Mary Kingsbury Simcovich, uh, you know, who was the wife of a professor of Embedkar at Columbia, Vladimir Simcovich. Uh, and I'm, I'm convinced Embedkar went to her Greenwich house. I just have to prove this. Embedkar definitely took five classes from Vladimir. So you could expand this circle out and scholars in pragmatism and pragmatist philosophy do that. Uh, you know, and they, they include people like Hu Shi in China. And it always bugged me that no one told the story or no one saw a story to be told of pragmatism and how it changed and evolved in India. Yet all these people do this about Hu Shi in China. So, uh, you know, at any rate, you'll see how I try to tell that story in the next few minutes. So, you know, one of the questions that I, I, I've wrestled with over the years, and as I've developed this project in kind of more preliminary articles and, and presentations, oftentimes I get a pushback that ah, Ambedkar wasn't a pragmatist. He was a Buddhist or he was a politician. And I think the assumption is that when you call someone a pragmatist, you mean they are just one thing. They have a set of doctrines they agree to and that's it. There's no difference from one pragmatist to the other. You know, and they assume that it excludes other things. If you're a pragmatist, you can't be something else for instance, a Buddhist uh, thinker. So these are both, I think, highly questionable assumptions. For instance, if you look at the historical tradition of pragmatism, you see a line of people who are influencing each other, some cases differing and disagreeing with each other, but there's still kind of this common historical thread that ties them through, and they are by no means identical. Hearst is radically different from John Dewey, uh, yet we, we still class them both as pragmatists. Uh, you know, and I, I think the second assumption that, you know, if you call him a pragmatist, it somehow means he's not a Buddhist. I think this is a ludicrous assumption. You're going to see by the end of this that Ambedkar's pragmatism is in many ways written in the language of reconstructed Buddhism. So, uh, you know, you call him a Buddhist and you see a certain aspect to his thought, foregrounded. Call him a political leader, you see another aspect. Call him a lawyer. And today and in my book, I want to see what vest vistas open up if we call him a pragmatist. So pragmatist could mean a historical tradition of influence. You know, you're placing someone in that kind of lineage. It could also mean a conceptual similarity where you say he's, his thought is like uh, Dewey's in this way or that way. Okay. It doesn't mean he is saying the exact same thing as Dewey. Okay. So, so you know, in, in the conceptual similarity approach, there's been some work out there that has held up Embedkar next to Dewey. Uh, you know, and this is useful to some extent, but in other ways, uh, you're going to see how that's limited. So I'm going to today focus a lot of weight on the historical angle of this, what Embedkar read, how it affected his writings, what uh, he heard in Dewey's classes, etc. So in other words, we, if we talk about Navayana pragmatism in general, you know, we could ask questions about the historical roots of it, you know, where it came from, how Dewey influenced kind of what Embedkar did and said. Uh, and, you know, as my book makes clear, influence can be a matter of saying this is a good idea, let's use it. Influence can also be a matter of saying, I disagree with this part of Dewey. And Embedkar definitely did that at some points. You could also ask the question about the conceptual parameters of his democratic and anti-caste thought. You know, so what is Embedkar's philosophy? What is his pragmatism in general? I'll return to that at the end, but I'm telling you now that I'll be focusing a lot of attention on the historical uh, angle of Embedkar's pragmatism.
at least in the talk today. Now back to the connection of these two individuals. John Dewey, the professor at Columbia University, and Bimrao Ambedkar, the young student who showed up at Columbia in 1913. What can we say about the relationship of these two starting at Columbia? Now, you know, if you start talking about pragmatism and Ambedkar, Dewey and Ambedkar, the first question I always ask myself is, you know, is someone simplifying these complex thinkers in a way that cuts too many corners? So for instance, there are folks out there that say, oh, Ambedkar moved beyond Dewey's pragmatism. Well, Dewey authored 8 million words. What part of those did Ambedkar read? What part of those represent Dewey's philosophy? You know, Dewey changed from his early Hegelian period to his later naturalist period. And Bedkar saw him right in the middle after he switched away from Hegel, but he took some of the Hegelian hoop with him, Dewey said. So I'm very skeptical on people that say and Bedkar moved beyond Dewey's pragmatism because one, Dewey's pragmatism was not one thing. Two, and Bedkar did not see one philosophy from Dewey. He took early things that Dewey didn't even agree with anymore from Dewey's writings and use them. And he took things that Dewey was still developing. Uh, and three, uh, you know, no one, including myself, has ever claimed that Embedkar just echoes exactly Dewey's whole philosophy. So, uh, you know, Embedkar also has a rich corpus of over four million words in English, uh, translation and original. So these two thinkers have to be approached with caution and humility. And there's so many things that we can get out of them, but no one thing exhausts what they are able to give us. Now back to Columbia, 1913, and Bedkar shows up in Morningside Heights in New York City. Uh, you know, the questions that drive my thinking on this are these. You know, what can we say something about what Bedkar learned from John Dewey? And then how did this affect the kind of philosophy that Bedkar writes about, talks about, and enacts back in India in his activism? I think that's one of the fascinating things about Bedkar. A lot of philosophers or theorists miss him as a theorist because they code him as an activist, okay? But in many ways, he was doing philosophy. He was doing pragmatist philosophy. And just like Jane Addams, she wrote books, but everyone thinks she's an activist. Uh, you know, he's not a philosopher if you say philosophers are people that write books for other people who write books who don't do anything but write books. So he's not that mode of just pure intellectual that doesn't do anything. So, so in many ways, like a lot of pragmatists, he has been overlooked as a philosophical voice because of his commitment to action. Yet this is one of the cores of what pragmatism is about and what I would class as Embedkar's pragmatist philosophy. So to cut to the, the thesis, I think, of Navayana pragmatism, we get this in, 19, in the 1950s in his unpublished Riddle Number 22 from Riddles in Hinduism. This was published much later after he died, of course. But there at the end of that interesting article on Brahma isn't Dharma, uh, you know, he talks about political theory, not just Advaita Vedanta. And, you know, he talks about at the end this interesting passage, and he says, philosophy has its roots in the problems of life, and whatever theories philosophy propounds must return to society as instruments of reconstructing society. So you'll see that this kind of pragmatist instinct, the idea that our theorizing is a tool not to capture the truth of reality, but to help us come into better adjustment with that reality animates the beginning of his thought up to the end of his writings. And he sees this early on. After 1929, he bought, in 1929, he bought a, a copy of the second edition of Dewey's Experience in Nature. And you see these are in Bedkar's marks from the copy held by Siddharth College. So, so he notices that experience is the key thing, lived experience, including the suffering of caste oppression, including the joys of life. And theory comes second to this. Theory is meant to help us Re rectify, ameliorate, and improve, and optimize that sort of lived experience. So what more can we say about Navayana pragmatism and its development? Well, let's start with Columbia. So everyone knows that he took classes from Dewey. What classes? Well, with the little digging through the Columbia bulletins you could, and his transcript, you could find out the exact, exact classes. So here are the exact classes he took. Philosophy 231, which was Dewey's, the first half of Dewey's one-year uh, section on psychological ethics, effectively. Uh, and then in 1915, 1916, he took philosophy 131, 132, which was a two course section. It took a whole year, one course, and then another course on moral and political philosophy. There's no evidence that he took or he audited or he was exposed to Dewey's education classes. He thought he was beginning to teach in teacher's college at that time. 
So we had three courses with Dewey. Now Dewey, you know, and Bedcar took over 50 courses, right? So people say, ah, you know, this is just a drop in the bucket. But as you'll see, a lot of the, the drops from Dewey, you know, expanded and exploded into new and creative parts of Embed Car's philosophy. So let's see what we can say about these courses. This is something that's always intrigued me. You know, everyone says Embed Car was so highly educated and he took all these classes. He took these classes in London. He took all these classes at Columbia, tried to take classes at Bonn. Uh, you know, and, but how did they affect him? You know, one of the, the questions you might ask if you're, you know, kind of skeptical enough, you say, what did he hear in these courses, right? Because Dewey taught courses, but Dewey didn't put 8 million words worth of his collected works into one semester. So how do we know what was in these classes? So this has always been a question that has bugged me when it comes to Embed Carr's education. And so, you know, in my book and today in this talk, I will dive into some of the archival research I have found that uh, lets us know, in, in some cases, on a daily basis, what Embed Carr heard at every class session. And then, you know, this gives us a different level of detail than just saying, do we wrote this book? So that must be what Embedkar read. You'll also see I refer to books that we know Embedkar read by Dewey because the copies still exist. Many are signed by Embedkar and uh, many parts are underlined. You know, so, so again, I, I want to approach this in as rigorous as a mas manner as possible. Embedkar did not know everything that was out there being written. He bought a lot of books, but he didn't read all the books. And he didn't agree with all the parts of the book. So we have to kind of find ways to be a little more, uh, you know, we need to find ways to interrogate this uh, in a rich fashion. So I want to organize the rest of my talk in these three fashions. One, I want to you know, look at these central concepts and, and how they relate to parts of Dewey. Again, you're going to see that Embedkar is not saying the exact same thing as Dewey, because Dewey knew about caste, but it wasn't foregrounded in his thought. It wasn't something that you know he was going to run with and make part of his democratic theory. And Bedkar, of course, it centered his philosophy around caste and then expanded out to democracy. So one, I want to look at caste as habit. Two, force as problematic but promising. And three, you know, the idea of religion as a useful means. And that's something, of course, that Dewey kind of gave up on in terms of real, robust, organized religion. So first, caste is habit. Let's return back to the root of this. 1914 in the fall, and Bedkar stumbles into his first Dewey class. Who knows how he got in there, right? He signed the Hazur order with the, the Gaikwad of Baroda saying he would only take classes in you know, economics and political science. So in some ways he wasn't supposed to be taking philosophy classes, but he had to have taken this class because Dewey was the American philosopher. Okay, he was the most prominent one in American, uh, you know, academia back then, arguably. So surely he wanted to hear something from this dude. So luckily he stumbled into that class, that philosophy seminar room, because he got exposed to Dewey uh, at an exciting period. Dewey was changing from his earlier Hegelian focus on self-realization, and he was getting more and more into a more naturalized way of doing uh, ethics, you know, but some ways based upon the sociological, anthropological faculty around him at Columbia, uh, some part based upon his philosophy of experience and nature being a key part. So, so at any rate, and Bedkar comes into this class and hears this exciting, you know, I think exciting series of lectures on psychological ethics in the fall. Uh, and in the spring, he takes a class from Vladimir Simkovich instead of Embedkar. I have a feeling that he heard what he needed to hear from Dewey's psychological ethics. So I, even though I found the whole year's lecture notes for this class, I know exactly what Embedkar heard and what part of the class he missed. So in this section of lectures, right, you start to see Embedkar hear some key points in Dewey's pragmatism, his you know, more naturalistic later pragmatism, which is where he emphasizes intelligence uh, and reflective thought a lot more. And he talks about habits, attitudes, and customs as ways to understand human societies and also normative ethics. So if you look at some of these notes, we have them typed up by Dewey. I have I found teacher lecture notes. Uh, I find students that have written out transcripts of this stuff. So uh, you know, you, there's a variety of sources I go through. But in these notes, it's fascinating because you get to hear what Dewey very likely, in a high likelihood, talked about. So for instance, there are these interesting mentions of Buddhism in these, these lectures where you know, Dewey kind of maligns Buddhism as quietism, as giving up. 
All right. So you can imagine a young Embedkar pulling his hair out, uh, you know, loving Buddhism from, uh, you know, getting uh, Kaluskar's book in uh, early in his life in 1907. And, you know, hearing this kind of stuff from someone he otherwise highly respects in a philosophical sense. So Dewey didn't think much of Buddhism. Uh, and that's a different story. I'm going to write up another day why Dewey had that skewed view. Uh, but you, you start to hear in a more topical sense, Dewey's philosophy of impulse. You know, the idea that humans have impulses or instincts, but they have no inherent moral quantity, quality. They're not inherently bad, uh, but they need to be modified. They need to be controlled in an intelligent fashion. So you start to see in these lectures, a wide idea of education, uh, not just formal schools educate, but social organizations educate. And what does it mean to educate? It means to shape our reactions and anticipations in the world in a useful fashion, not just in some universally right way, but in a you know, temporary but useful fashion. You also see Dewey start talking about the connection of psychology to culture. So, you know, he talks at some point, points about civilizations, uh, you know, have, have, have turned, uh, you know, their, their impulses of their individual members in certain ways, uh, you know, and that these are going to be habits in one verbiage and customs in another. So, you know, so Dewey recognizes that cultures are a relativity to cultures, how they adapt uh, and their members adapt to certain social or natural environments. But, you know, in a typical pragmatist spirit, he kind of foregrounds the idea that this is not only, this is not the way it always has to be. You can change that adaptation or that adaptation could be useful, but not optimal. And surely, as we'll see in a second, that struck young Ambedkar, who comes from India, a land that has thousands of years of traditions and customs that he finds problematic in some ways. Now, you also see in these lecture notes, Dewey opine on attitude. And we're going to see how that's important in a second. But attitude was kind of a mental habit. Uh, it was towards an object. It had emotional valences. We like something. We were attracted to something. We were repelled from something. We were disgusted by something. We didn't like something. So, so it has this kind of orienting effect on the human organism in a social or natural environment. So you see here, this, what Embedkar was hearing in these classes was not Dewey the idealist, the neo-Hegelian idealist. He was hearing Dewey as a naturalist, uh, giving an explanation of society and culture as an evolutionary adaptation. Okay, You also hear, interestingly enough, Dewey give part of his philosophy that I think is incredibly important to understanding what he was about, which is what he calls elsewhere the philosophic fallacy, where Dewey cautions in a variety of places, including in these 1914 lectures to Embedkar and his classmates, that we, sh you know, when we theorize, theorize, but never, never mistake the results of theorization or the things of theorization, abstract words or concepts, for the fact of experience. Okay, so you know, talk about the mind, but don't get hung up or talk about the understanding like Kant, but don't get hung up that there is a thing in the head that is the understanding and nothing else. It's just a way of understanding one functional adaptation of the organism to the environment uh, you know, and your theory helps you understand that and do something with it, but it doesn't like capture the reality of experience. So you see that kind of pluralistic notion of experience from James and Dewey in these lectures, the idea that experience can be cut up in many ways through analysis, but never say there's only one way that it really is. So uh, when we get to embed car in the 30s, you start, and you know this stuff about what he learned in class, you start to see a different, more richer story a penumbra around it of what he was doing with caste and his critique of caste. So for instance, in the Annihilation of Caste, he has this odd turn where he says, very much opposed to our modern sensibilities of discrimination as systemic, he says caste is a notion, it's a state of mind. And it doesn't mean the destruction of a physical barrier, it means a notional change, an attitudinal change in an individual. So you see why he starts to say this, right? I mean, he's he's applying and extending and changing this kind of line of psychology that runs through Dewey that he heard in Dewey's class. We know this for a fact because I found the notes uh, where these notions are, are connected to attitudes and these attitudes can give us helpful or less helpful orientations towards the world. So, you know, for instance, again, in the Annihilation of Caste, he talks about you need to have reform, not of laws, not of society, but of mental attitudes of specific people towards men and things. And he talks about caste labels, names, concepts being associated with certain notions and sentiments. 
So in other words, Cast is very much committing the fallacy of the philosophical fallacy, the idea of you know, taking these terms and concretizing them. Someone is a Shudra, someone is a Varna, uh, you know, nothing else. And you know, they really are that. That term has been taken with too much seriousness and it hurts experience. So, you know, Embedkar definitely paid attention to this theme that's in Dewey. So for instance, here's that 1929 edition of Experience of Nature and the, the red lines are mine, but the check marks are Baba Sahib's. And, you know, you notice here he's underlining, uh, you know, or he's annotating the parts of Dewey's work that really talks about problematic situations are the things that call upon us to theorize or reflectively think through problems. But much of life isn't this reflective thinking. So, you know, this, this kind of background helps you understand why an annihilation of caste, he was so shocking to his upper caste but reform-oriented audience at the Mandal. Uh, he was trying to present a crisis to them problematize their shastras, to problematize uh, their culture and their habits that came from their group affiliation, you see? So, so in other words, he was trying to spur reflective thought by creating a problematic situation. So you start to see that uh, Dewey's psychology mattered in certain ways, and then Bedkar was doing things that Dewey didn't do with his psychology. Now let's turn to theme two, the theme about force and social democracy. And this is going to draw us to the last year at Columbia and Bedkar spent in a classroom, and 1915, 1916. And the class specifically is philosophy 131, 132, moral and political philosophy. Now, one thing I'll note, this one in 231, 232, those courses, Dewey taught those going back to his time at Chicago in the 1890s. And there's about three or four surviving lecture notes series that have been published from those older lectures. And they're all different. So again, I really caution you if someone says, ah, Dewey stood for this and Bedkar stood for this, they're not the same. Well, of course, but even Dewey over the period of time of 15 years teaching the same class taught different things, argued for different things, foregrounded different things. So Bedkar heard a specific version of philosophy 131, 132. And, you know, I find, you know, how do I know what he heard? Well, I found notes from other students in that class and three of those days, for instance, I give you one here and I circle in Bedkar's name, uh, you know, they're, you, they're noted as that day was taken, the notes were taken by Embedkar. So we know for a fact that Embedkar was there for these classes. We know for a fact that he was taking notes, et cetera. So what did he hear in these classes and what difference did it make? Well, this class was interesting for a variety of reasons. And I'm still unpacking the importance of this. You know, this, I think, was his tour de force through Western political philosophy, from Hegel to Marx to Fichte. He heard five class sessions on Fichte. He only heard like two or three on Kant. So, you know, here, here's Dewey go through all these kind of uh, philosophical uh, you know, movements. But one of the things that I'll talk about today that stuck, two of the things really, are forces, energy, and the liberty, equality, fraternity trio. He hears that liberty, equality, fraternity trio I remember the date right, in March of 1916. It's there in the lectures. So Bedkar was surely 10 feet from Dewey when he hears Dewey talk about this. I, th this is our, I know this is our first documented instance where Bedkar read or heard about these terms. He might have done it earlier, but you know what evidence do we have? So we know for sure he heard this in 1916 uh, from Dewey. So you know, of course, these are incredibly important for Bedkar. They are not very important terms for the later philosophy of Dewey. Dewey drops them after 1888, really. Uh, but, it, you know, Dewey, and Bedkar writes them in to the preamble of the Constitution. He writes them into his Buddhist gospel or Bible in the 1950s, uh, and he argues them when he talks about social democracy. So they become these kind of sorts of semi-transcendental ideals, guides for life that aren't sanitan or, you know, unchanging, like the things he wanted to critique, but they're useful for saying what's wrong with Hinduism as he sees it. Now, Dewey did not use these terms this way. So, uh, you know, this is a fascinating kind of version of the reconstructiveness of Embedkar's Naviana pragmatism. And you see this in the 1950s, again, from Riddle 22. You see in the drafts of Riddle 22, uh, you know, Brahma is not Dhamma, you see Embedkar working and reworking his way of talking about democracy as an attitude and as fraternity as an attitude. You also see him flirt with Kant, right? And Bedkar, there's stories to be told about him, Bedkar and Kant. I found books that he has of Kant that he underlined. And, uh, you know, I, I, but one thing I think he found useful in Kant is the idea of 
formula of humanity as an end in itself, the idea that no person should be treated merely as a means, but always as an end. I, th I also find that the most valuable thing in Kant's moral philosophy. So you see in that riddle number 22 draft, uh, you know, and Bedkar toys with putting that in there as kind of a cardinal statement about the social democracy he wants to push. Uh, but, you know, he ends up siding more with Dewey's later thought and arguing what? Democracy is a attitude of mind or a philosophy of life, not just a political arrangement. So again, you see these kind of echoes uh, through his political philosophy. Now, before we get back to force, let's take account of where we're at. Uh, you know, what do we, if you ask me, what, what are some of the general parameters of his Navayana pragmatism, Stroud? You've talked a lot about lecture notes, et cetera. You know, I, I give you something like this. I'd say, well, most central to his Navayana pragmatism is the idea of social democracy. Caste, you know, my reading of Embedkar, caste is vital, but caste is problematic because Embedkar is a theorist of democracy, deep democracy, social democracy, and caste is antithetical to that. So social democracy, what do, does Navayana pragmatism mean about social democracy? Well, it's this, and this is different from what Dewey says about deep democracy. Uh, and Bedkar maintains, you know, in various places that liberty and equality and fraternity are defining values of social democracy, uh, and that there's there, a balance among them becomes justice. So not just equality is key to justice, but all three of these things. And also, social democracy concerns individuals, you know, that have attitudes or habits. Also concerns communities, you know, what kind of group we form, how much respect or shared interest they have. Okay, and then also, you know, and this is a, it's something that I think Embedkar, and I argue this in the book, he pulls this from the 1908 edition of Ethics. You'll see a little bit of this in a second. It's a book Dewey wrote before Embedkar heard him in class, and that Dewey was moving away from in class, yet Embedkar found something valuable in that. And that is, in 1908, Dewey, along with James Tufts, wrote this book on ethics, and they really foregrounded the idea that ethical cultures or groups, uh, groups that have highly moralized customs, encourage reflective individuals. They don't just encourage unthinking devotion or replication of a cultural group. They encourage reflective continuation of that group, but it's at the individual level. Dewey largely abandons this by 1932 in the second edition of that book, and Bedkar didn't know about that second edition. So, so at any rate, this is one of the things I like to stress is that Embedkar was very selective and was very incomplete in what he heard from Dewey, what he read from Dewey. And so never assume Dewey is one thing and that Embedkar accepted or rejected that whole thing. So let's get into the details a bit more. Back to theme two, force and reform. In 1908, Embedkar penned what I believe is his only book review. It's in an economics journal based out of Mumbai and it's reviewing Bertrand Russell, British philosophers, principles of social reconstruction a book that was published in 1916 in Europe and then an American edition called Why Men Fight was published in 1917. So this is odd for a variety of reasons. And most accounts of Embedkar skip right over it. Every biography mentions it and then moves on. I think this is a, a, this is a mistake. Because one, it's his only book review. Why did he review the work of someone else? What did he want to do in reviewing the work of someone else? Why review in an economics journal with a largely Indian audience a book by a British philosopher that had nothing to do with economics largely and was about really the war? You know, and Bedkar says at the beginning, this is a war book. So there's, it's just an enigma here waiting for us to figure out. So, and you'll see it has a connection to pragmatism. So onto this book. If you look at this book, it's a short book. It's readable as most of Russell's books are. Uh, you know, and, and one of the fascinating things Russell gets into is, you know, he, he's 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 wrestling with the idea of why World War I, the Great War, World War One, was happening. And the thing he notes with very, you know, just a harsh critical eye is that, well, each side, the British or the Germans, you know, thinks it fights for the right, and it, you know that it deserves to triumph, and the other side is just awful, uh, you know, and and the other side is oppressing the side that has the right. Uh, you know, views, morals, et cetera. You know, and so he says quite bluntly that, you know, this kind of shows a cycle that goes on in society and among societies where the oppressed, you know, fight for freedom against oppression and injustice. But then he worries that 
you know, in a kind of cynical Hegelian fashion, that when the oppression win freedom, they, uh, you know, form a new sort of oppression as oppressive as their former masters. So what Russell is giving you here, and what I'm sure Embedkar sensed was the problem with reform. You know, if you're going to change the world, how do you ensure you're not just as bad in a different way, but just as bad as the people you saw as your enemies or your oppressors? So Embedkar appreciates this book, I'm sure, because of that. And in the review, the very short review, he makes the first published mention to the, his professor Dewey. He talks about the language of Dewey, and uh, you know, he, he engages what he worries about as the passivity and quietism of Indians. Now, he might be talking about Gandhi. Gandhi got off the boat and started uh, movements in 1917. But I, you know, what he's referring to, I believe, and I argue this in my book, is Dewey's problems with Tolstoy. You know, and, and the nonviolence or the passive resistance view that Tolstoy largely stood for in that period. So, so he refers, and Bedkar refers to Dewey on force as violence and force as energy, and basically argues that, look, don't take Russell as saying all force is bad. You should take it as Dewey says, that violent force destroys more ends than it preserves. And force as energy constructively maximizes the achievement of all, as many ends as possible. Now, where did he get that from? That's always been a question for me. You know, and about a year or so ago, two years ago, I finally figured it out when I discovered those philosophy 131, 132 lecture notes. And, you know, he got this from Dewey's class. You'll see that in a second. But one interesting thing I've more recently figured out, uh, looking at the archival materials on Hushur, the Chinese reformer, politician, you know, and pragmatist of a stripe, was also a student of Dewey's. Everyone knows this. Uh, but you know, Hushur took the same class as Embedkar. He sat in the same room in 1915, 1916 as, as Embedkar did. And he, he too was also influenced by Dewey's reading of forces, energy, forces, violence. But that's a story you know, for, for later digging on my part. But back to Embedkar and Dewey. In April of 1916, we have the lecture notes where Dewey talks like this. In the case of force, which is a means, you have words which make a distinction. Energy and violence. Energy is the ability to do work. Violence connotes destructive power or force. Okay. And, you know, again, interestingly enough, look at the kind of, uh, you know, asides Dewey, this, the kind of short mentions Dewey makes. He talks, you know, he's, he's railing on the pa policy of passive inaction. And at the end of this list of philosophies, uh, you know, that, that might be theories of passive inaction, he throws out nirvana. And again, I'm sure Embedkar was, you know, shocked or disappointed or uh, you know worried that Dewey had such a limited vision of Buddhism. Uh, but you know, Medkar, as we see, did not. But at any rate, you have this idea. Forces energy is good. It preserves ends as many as possible. Forces violence destroys a lot more ends in pursuit of one end. You also see in these lectures, interestingly enough, Dewey talk about non-resistance. You know, and, and again, he's talking mainly about Tolstoy, but Tolstoy influences Gandhi. Gandhi influences Embedkar when it comes to nonviolence and ahimsa. So uh, you, you get this interesting chain from Tolstoy. And you know, Dewey's not against non-resistance, but he's against saying you, ought, you have to be non, you have to always resist the use of force in every domain, every instance. Okay. So for instance, Dewey was for the use of force in World War I. Uh, you know, and interestingly enough, the second conclusion he ruminates about in front of Husher and and in Bedkar in that classroom is, you know, you know, don't, okay, so universal nonviolence is not useful, uh, but, you know, what kind of method ought we to, what kind of mix of force ought we to do? Well, that's essentially a scientific question. It's an empirical question. We need to experiment, try different things, change our commitments. Uh, so again, you get this kind of idea in Dewey. Philosophy is not about just finding eternal truths and sticking with them. It's about flexibility, and finding effective means for certain situations. So back to that idea of force and reform. The challenge, one of the challenges from Bedkar's pragmatism from 1918 to the very end of his life is how do you achieve a social democracy, which means a balance among equality, liberty, and fraternity without sacrificing one of these? And that's what force as violence or too much force would do. It would intrude upon one of these uh, values. Now let's look at theme three, the last theme I'll talk about today. And this is the idea of religion as an intelligent means of democratic reform. Dewey didn't give much weight to religion. He wrote a book in, 19, in the early 1930s 
Uh, but it was a very, you know, it was a very wishy-washy, in my view, book of religion. It was, you know, Dewey was a Christian. He gave 200 some lectures to the Christian Association at Michigan before he moved on to Chicago in the 1890s. But, uh, you know, at, at, later in his life, Dewey supposedly uh, someone's, you know, I think his mom or someone said, why aren't your kids going to Sunday school? And Dewey said something like this. He said, uh, well, you know, I went to enough Sunday school as a kid for all of us. So in many ways, Dewey drifted away from organized religion later in his life. And Bedkar, as we all know, you know, liked religion in an organized fashion and wanted to reorganize Buddhism so it was optimally effective. So let's talk about religion as an intelligent means of democratic reform. Now, you know, we've talked about social democracy. Here's one of the four copies of Democracy and Education that I have found amongst the surviving books in Embedkar's collections. It's Siddharth College, Malin College, private collections, et cetera. And Embedkar loved Democracy and Education. I think if there's one book that stands behind the Indian Constitution above all other books, it's going to be this book. You know, because this influenced Embedkar, and Embedkar influenced some of those values that end up in the preamble and the Constitution. But the 19, he got this book in 1917. How do we know? Inside the cover, and Bedkar signs it and says he got in London, January 6, 1917, after his time with Dewey. So in this book, you see multiple styles of annotation. As I argue in my book, I think this, this doesn't have a systematic meaning that I can tell. It really means he sat with it with different pencils at different times. So he read this book at least two or three times because there are two or three different color of pencils annotating the same sections. So he kept coming back to it. And this is where you have this line, uh, you know, democracy is more, Dewey writes, than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, a conjoint communicated experience. Now, Dewey wasn't talking about caste here. He's trying to argue for a rich system of, of education and a view of education and experience. But Embedkar saw this as kind of a, a, a theme, a deep base note for the critique of caste. And of course, he runs with this from the 1930s on, okay? Another book he really loved of Dewey's, and I found two copies of this at Siddharth College, is the 1908 edition of Ethics by Dewey and Tufts. And in both copies of that book, you have Embedkar independently putting some lines next to uh, a key section on principles and rules. And here's that section blown up a bit. And this is where Dewey makes this incredibly interesting distinction where rules are kind of mechanical, they're habitual ways of doing things, but principles are intellectual. They're useful methods of judging things. So Dewey makes the reference to the Ten Commandments being rules, don't kill. Very limiting or very specific is another way to put it. Uh, principles are like the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have done unto yourself. That's more flexible, more ambiguous, more vague, uh, you know, more applicable in various situations than rules. So, so Dewey recognizes that these both have advantages, but you know, Dewey really wants reflective individuals to be guided by principles in this 1908 book, especially. Okay, now Embedkar saw this, and, and I think he latched onto this as one useful part of all the stuff Dewey's talking about. Not all of it's useful, of course, but you know, this was a, interesting for Baba Sahib. So, so in 1936, in Annihilation of Caste, you probably have read this, this section where Embedkar, he doesn't refer to Dewey, but it wouldn't gain him anything in talking. Uh, to the Mandal he's supposed to be talking to. So he he just echoes this distinction from Dewey where he talks about principles and rules. But if you know your Dewey and you've seen those an annotations, you see where he got this from. Rules are practical, and Bedkar says. They're habitual ways. Uh, principles, and Bedkar writes, are intellectual. They're useful ways of judging things. So let's jump forward to the 1950s. What's Embedkar mainly doing after 1951 or so when he you know leaves politics or the halls of power for the most part, he turns to social and religious advocacy. He starts giving a lot more speeches, promulgating you know, Buddhism as a way for Dalits to get out of caste oppression. You know, in one of these later speeches, he, he talks about why Buddhism declines in India. And it's always, you know, this is always an interesting passage. It stuck out to me. Not many people notice it, but he says, ah, you know, Buddhism declined because it lacked abiding principles in it. It lacked conquering orators and it lacked understandable principles. And I submit to you, and I you know, make this argument here, I make this argument elsewhere, that Embedkar had a great value for those kind of orators. He wanted to be one himself. He gave over 500 speeches that we have on record, uh, and probably more than that. So he was a powerful speaker. Dewey wasn't. Uh, and you know, the principles 
or something that he saw as important and reflective morality, and religion was going to be a way to install that or instill that. Now, another thing that struck me when I was looking through books that are otherwise maybe unnotable, he has a book uh, in, the, in the Start collection that embed Caron, Karma and Rebirth, and he, none of it's underlined except on the table of contents, this 1948 book. Uh, and Bedkar writes this on the table of contents. He says, what place has will and effort in the law of karma? So you literally can see that as he's reading these books or as he's thinking through or against these books in the 1940s, 1950s, he's concerned with the place of effort. He wants to have a place for individuals to make a difference and not just wait for systematic change, not just wait for systems to stop oppressing, but to do something on their own with their own habits, perhaps, that could help improve or ameliorate experience. So now let's look at the, the instance that I think most highlights that focus on will and willful effort as key to reform. Go to Nagpur, October 14, 1956. Bimrao and Savita Embedkar take the stage in front of you know, 300,000 to 600,000 individuals, the estimates vary, and they convert to Buddhism using a uh, a diksha ritual that Embedkar, Bimrao Embedkar himself authored. And then those, most of those individuals, around a half a million, voluntarily converted in mass right after his conversion. So this is a fascinating event because as I see it, it's one of the, I think it's, it's unique in the history of philosophy because he has this pragmatist philosophy of individuals, you know, becoming part of the reform of social democracy and gaining self-respect. Uh, and, you know, so this pragmatism, Navayana pragmatism, and you have this, this instance of conversion, and that conversion is integrally related to his view of the individual taking charge of ameliorating their habits and maybe even their group customs. So it's a meeting of religious conversion and his philosophy. So, for instance, look at the, the 22 vows and think about what we said about rules and think about what we said about principles and how they differ. And you start to see how some of them are rules. They're very specific. I will not consume liquor, uh, et cetera. Okay, but many of them, and some of the most important I would submit to you are principles in the Deweyan sense. Okay, now of course Dewey didn't have, Dewey didn't come up with a religious uh, you know, conversion ceremony that hundreds of thousands of people converted to to become card-carrying Deweyans. So uh, this is just fascinating that Embedkar's philosophy and his kind of view of reflective morality influences his conversion ritual that he and hundreds of thousands of individuals go through to get self-respect and to demand respect from others. So you see, some of these are clear principles. I believe in the equality of mankind. I will establish equality. These don't tell you exactly how to do it. They apply to Embedkar's time. They hopefully will give us some guidance in terms of Twitter or Facebook or whatever comes next on social media. So they're flexible principles that can meet the demands of changing situations. Okay, so in other words, these are principles that we can use to rectify our habits and to create and enact reflective morality, just like Dewey wanted cultures to do in their individuals in 1908. So now let's look to another part of the 1950s. Embedkar authors in 1951, The Buddha and His Gospel. He shares this, about 50 copies of this with scholars and other individuals, a draft. Apparently none of them wrote back you know, comments. Uh, but that book changes. It changes partially because of one of the articles uh, you know, you, that were shared in this reading group. Uh, in 1954, Embedkar gets a copy of Dewey's Creative Democracy Address from 1939. Uh, and you know, I've seen this in the archives. It's, it's not noted in many works on Embedkar, but he had this. And it came from V.B. Kadam, you know, as, as someone who was writing to, getting him to send books uh, from London. So, so at any rate, you know, the second edition, which Embedkar was madly revising around 1954, 1955, right before he dies in 56, it has whole new sections added to it. And I want to you know, explore this in my future work. But one of those sections that was added is the section, book four, on Ahimsa. You know, and there you see in the Buddha and his Dhamma, which ultimately gets published in 1957, Embedkar wrestles with the idea of Ahimsa, nonviolence, and does it mean the exact same thing, let's say someone, a Gandhian would say it means, or Gandhi would say it means. You know, and Embedkar wrestles with this, and he says, well, you know, there's the question, is Ahimsa absolute in Buddhism or only relative? And then he talks in a way that you recognize as a pragmatist way of talking. Was it only a principle or was it a rule? And then at the, the following verses, 
you know, he says, no, it's ahimsa is a more flexible principle. It's something like love all so that you may not wish to hurt anyone or kill anyone. And that's a positive way of stating the principle of ahimsa. And then Embedkar continues, from this, it appears that the doctrine of ahimsa does not say kill not, it says love all. So he explicitly allies it with a principle. And he says, uh, you know, rules, ahimsa as an absolute rule, uh, doesn't give you any freedom to act. It either breaks you or you break the rule. So, you know, ahimsa for him is best reconstructed as a principle or a, a way of life, he says here. Again, this doesn't appear in 1951. So, uh, you know, he's, he's ref he comes back to certain parts of Dewey at certain times in his life, and it makes a difference at these parts. Uh, so, so, in other words, what he's doing here, as you can see, is that Navayana Buddhism, especially in his Buddhist text, uh, you know, from 1957, you know, he, he, he puts forward ahimsa as this kind of intellectual tool. It's a religion of principle, in other words. And right, if you remember back to the annihilation of caste, what did he want there? He wanted to reform, he wanted to destroy Hinduism as a religion of rules, but not necessarily as a religion of principles, he says in 36. He says, maybe you can reach into the Upanishads or Sikhism and its uh, gurus and texts, and you could find something that uh, gives you a principle-based religion. Something that's flexible and not really constrained. Uh, by 1957, of course, with his book that comes out in 57, he you know, is pretty convinced that he needs Buddhism, not Hinduism reconstructed. But Buddhism becomes his way of finding a religion of principle that can give you liberty, equality, and fraternity. So, you know, you look at other texts in the 50s, like the Buddha and Marx manuscript, that the unpublished book, but it's really just a 30 or so page manuscript. You know, he praises the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution, uh, because it produced equality, but he worries that it sacrificed fraternity and liberty. And, you know, he says, well, it seems that all three can coexist only if one follows the way of the Buddha and not communism, which can give you one, perhaps, equality, but not all three. So the Buddha's method to get this, right, this is fascinating. Uh, again, it kind of jars with our modern sensibilities when we say oppression is systematic or systemic. And we say, how do you solve that? You look at big changes at that system level, not just something you do on a Wednesday. But, uh, you know, in, in this text in the 1950s, you know, in Bedkar, who has felt his whole life the, the pressure of caste, uh, you know, he says Buddha had a different method. It was to alter man's disposition, okay, uh, to get people to voluntarily do something, the right thing, without the use of force or compulsion. And the way the Buddha did this in 1957 in the book that was published then, at least, was through the constant preaching of his Dhamma. So the Buddha's way was not to force people to do what they did not like to do, although it was good for them. It was to alter the disposition so they wanted to do that. So again, you see this idea of willful, willful effort mattering. You can't force other people to exactly be perfect. Uh, and that the one way you can get them to go in the right direction is through persuasion or rhetoric. So a fascinating new way to look at his Buddhism, I think. Uh, and you see this kind of view uh, of, you know, dialing back destructive force and creating community even with enemies in the Buddha and his Dhamma when he says, cherish no anger, win your enemies by love. This is the Buddhist way of life. Now, Ambedkar had a lot of reason to be angry, of course. But at the end of his life, this theme is foregrounded in his books that, it, you know, to his followers, the idea that you have to make community with your enemies, and not just destroy them, disempower them, or find a way to be oppressive to them. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, you start to see that Buddhism, Navayana Buddhism, becomes a way to get social democracy in Ambedkar's scheme. You know, so he doesn't leave behind talk of democracy when he starts talking about Buddhism. He doesn't leave behind pragmatism. These are all connected. Democracy, social democracy, Buddhism, and this kind of doing pragmatism that lies way back in his past and also in his present. So in summary, if you ask me to, at this point, kind of sketch out some of the commitments to Embedkar's Navayana pragmatism, what is distinctive about pragmatism once it gets to India and gets developed in Embedkar's writings, I put these kind of themes in your mind. Now, more has to be written on this. I'm going to keep writing on this for the rest of my life. I'm sure of it. But, you know, one thing that I see as distinctive is, like Dewey, Ambedkar had an expansive sense of educational means. He started educational societies that were effectively like hostels, like Greenwich Village, uh, like Greenwich House that Simcovich ran in New York, uh, you know, or Jane Addams ran in Chicago. 
uh, you know, but he also saw means of education and reform like speeches, like newspapers. You know, so this is so different than just starting only schools. He did so much more than schools because education is about experience and certain kinds of experience can be educative. Second, you see this, this keynote theme of social democracy for Embed Carr involves equality, liberty, and fraternity, especially the balance among them. You cannot say one is above the others. Three, habits and attitudes or customs, group customs, uh, are, are vi uh, vital to democracy. So like Dewey's psychology, he has this, in, you know, this complex but useful dialectic between the individual and community. Individuals are created by communities, but individuals at some moments can use their own willfulness and their own effort, like in his conversion uh, you know, ceremony, to change certain things about the group, or at least try to strike a blow against the group. Four, uh, you know, he held a place for individual reformers. You know, he didn't want to just talk about communities and forget that suffering was of individuals, felt by individuals. He was the one who couldn't find housing when he came back from London in 1918 or 17, right? Uh, you know, so, so the suffering is unique uh, in many ways, but there are common kinds of ways we can talk about suffering. Don't mistake the abstract for the specific, but you could usefully talk about the specific with the abstract. So, so he had this dialectic between individual and communities in his pragmatism that was incredibly useful. Uh, and lastly, you know, different from Dewey and many other pragmatists, he saw religion, kind of an organized or reorganized religion, as a way to exert the right kind of force, the right kind of persuasive force, and channel the right kind of willful effort. So all these things, I think, add up to a new entry in what we talk about when we talk about what varieties of pragmatist philosophy are there. There's James doing this, there's Dewey doing that, there's the Italian pragmatist doing this, there's Hu Shur doing this in China. Well, this is the story of pragmatism in India, I think, and it has to start with Embedkar, and we'll see where it goes from there. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a really, really wide ranging and, and really fascinating account, uh, ma many of aspects of which are, I, I have just come across thanks to you. So it's really, really um, quite rich.